my name's Gary Richter. I'm a veterinarian. Um, I've been a veterinarian in the San Francisco Bay Area for about 25 years. I started sort of seeing the limitations of what I was doing. You know, like any other algorithm, there is an end to that process, at which point you have no more options. Once that door is open and you can see what's on the other side, like you don't unsee that. Did you ever have a point in discovering these new modalities where something might have been working, but it really conflicted with what you knew to be true? I think a really excellent example of that is acupuncture and Chinese medicine in general. I've heard people discount Chinese medicine. I'm like, you're legitimately gonna throw away three to 5,000 years <laughs> worth of medical tradition just because it doesn't make sense to you? Right. It's so close-minded. Okay, first of all, Dr. Richter, thank you so much for being on today. We're very excited to get into some of these topics. We've admired your work for a long time. We have one of your books. So we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and our audience today. Oh, you bet. I'm thrilled to be here. Appreciate it. So before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of the chain of events that occurred to get you into the position that you're in now? My name's Gary Richter. I'm a veterinarian. Um, I've been a veterinarian in the San Francisco Bay Area for about 25 years. Uh, and you know, like every veterinarian, my, my formal training, uh, is very sort of strictly Western conventional medicine. Um, when I got out of school and uh, I went to school, at the university of Florida, when I moved out to the West coast, I worked a variety of jobs, uh, general practice, emergency medicine, um, uh, eventually bought a veterinary practice in the area. Um, you know, and it was a number of years into practicing when I kind of, I kind of had what, uh, you know, what one might describe as a bit of a professional crisis mm. uh, in the sense of I started sort of seeing the limitations of what I was doing. Um, so in other words, when, you know, when you practice medicine, I think what a lot of people don't realize about medical practices is, is in large part, you're following an algorithm. So it's a very, it's, it's a big complex if then statement. So if your patient has these symptoms, then you do this. If your test results show this, then you do this. And you kind of work your way down the treatment algorithm. Um, and, you know, and, and like, you know, like any other algorithm, there is an end to that process, at which point you have no more options from a treatment perspective. And, you know, after having been out in practice for a few years, I was really starting to see sort of where these hard stops were uh, in what I was doing. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that I never enjoyed doing is going to a pet owner and telling them that there's nothing more we can do. Take your pet home and let us know when it's time to say goodbye. Um, I didn't like having that conversation. I still don't like having that conversation. Uh, and what it did was, is it led me to start investigating what else is out there. Uh, so, you know, my first foray into sort of non-conventional medicine was acupuncture. Uh, and when I started, you know, when I got trained in acupuncture and started doing it, what I found was, is I was getting responses in patients that I was never able to get before with purely conventional medicine. Wow. Uh, and, you know, I mean, as I've often said, you know, like once that door is open and you can see what's on the other side, like you don't unsee that. <laughs> so acupuncture led to chiropractic, led to herbal medicine, led to, um, uh, hyperbaric oxygen, ozone therapy, regenerative medicine, what have you. Uh, and it kind of just led me down this pathway of, you know, my professional mission became, let me, let me see how many scientifically legitimate treatment modalities I can find out there and integrate into a practice along with the Western medicine that I already know how to practice. And let me see how good I can make things. Uh, and that's kind of really what's been going on more or less for the last 20 years or so. Um, so, you know, now I own, I own a practice in the, in the East Bay called Holistic Veterinary Care, which is very comprehensive integrative medicine. Um, uh, as you know, I've written several books. Uh, I do a lot of teaching. Uh, I, you know, I, I formulate supplements and, and all natural food. And, you know, I mean, all of this is with the same underlying goal of how do I help my patients live better, longer lives? 
Uh, and that's really, that's the distillate of all of it. And, and, you know, I'll, I'll more or less look at any scientifically valid option that will get me further down that path. So th that's an interesting term you mentioned, any uh, scientifically available option. I'm curious if you ever had a point, because you were trained in a conventional Western man manner, did you ever have a point in discovering these new modalities where, where something might have been working, but it really conflicted with what you knew to be true, you know, scientifically or in the Western culture? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that kind of stuff absolutely happens. And some of it, some of it is a function of, you know, sometimes things that happen outside of Western medicine just don't really follow the Western medical paradigm in the sense that they don't lend themselves well to conventional Western medical research. I think a really excellent example of that is acupuncture and Chinese medicine in general. So uh, as a, for example, from a Western medical perspective, if I have 10 dogs come into my office that are older dogs with arthritis, they all have the same diagnosis and they all get treated in the same way from a purely Western perspective. You could have a Chinese doctor or a tra you know, somebody trained in Chinese medicine, look at those 10 dogs with arthritis and probably come up with five or six or seven different diagnoses depending on the specifics of what, what is going on with each one of those dogs. And thus, those dogs are going to get different treatment, different acupuncture points, different herbal therapy options. And the reason why that matters is because, you know, so like, for example, if you're gonna, if you're, if you're gonna try and get a, a, a drug approved by the FDA to treat arthritis, you're gonna do the very standard double-blinded, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trial um, to prove that your product works for dogs with a diagnosis of osteoarthritis. So the problem with Chinese medicine is, is that doesn't work because those dogs with that osteoarthritis diagnosis have a whole bunch of different Chinese medical diagnoses. So it's a much more personalized medicine. And thus, sometimes it just doesn't lend itself well to that particular type of research paradigm. So I think one of the things that we have to do is we don't have to say, well, research doesn't matter. Uh, but what we have to do is kind of broaden our scope a little bit of what that research can look like. Um, so as a, for example, uh, you know, you can look at research that's published in China that looks at, say, people with arthritis and you can take that whole group of people that were treated with arthritis and compare them, for example, to a group of people that were treated with Western meds for arthritis. And you can you can correlate the differences. It's just that that group of, of, of arthritis patients that were treated with Chinese medicine were not all treated with the same thing. But as a group, they got better when they were treated properly. Yeah. Um, so it's it's it, and, and I think this is where like a Western medical mind starts to have problems with all of this, because we're all trained that that gold standard is that double-blinded, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trial. It's great when the thing that you're testing fits into that box. Yeah, it's just not every not it's just that not everything fits into that box. And so, you know, I use that term scientifically valid, and and you know, I mean, there's a lot of ways people can look at that, but I mean, you know, what I mean by that is like, I you know, you have people come to you and you're like, oh, well, you know try this because in my hands it works or, or, you know, I mean, the, the, the flippant answer is like you get people burning sage and waving crystals and saying they're healing cancer. Yeah. Um, like to me, that's not, that's not, that's not solid medicine. I'm not going to 100% say that that stuff doesn't work. <laughs> right. But I can't go to my client or the pet owner and say, this is what I'm recommending. And this is the foundation that it sits upon then it's not something that I'm really comfortable recommending because people come to me, people come to me for help with their pets because, because within that scope of things, I am the expert in the, in the moment. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, I don't necessarily, like if I go to the doctor, I don't necessarily want my doctor just like trying something out on me because <laughs> somebody told them it works. Yeah. You know, I want somebody saying, 
yeah, I know this works. This is why it works. I've done this before. You're good. Right. And that's what people are looking for for me. So that's, that's the way I approach it. So it could be argued that perhaps I approach holistic medicine with a, with a Western mindset. Uh, and I'm happy to embrace that. I think there's a lot to be said for Western medicine. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just, you know what it, it, I think the problem is, is there is no one thing. Yeah. Western medicine's not the one thing. Holistic medicine's not the one thing. Uh, you know, like, like everything in life, almost nothing is black and white. Yeah. And we just have to take the best of everything that's out there and figure out what's right for the individual. So is there a name for that? Because we've thought about this concept of like, you, you walk into a doctor's office or a pet walks into a veterinarian's office and they have an issue and every single modality is taken into consideration as a potential treatment for this issue. Is that, we've been calling it one medicine. Is there a term for it? One medicine is as good a term as any. Uh, I often use the term integrative medicine. Yeah, totally. But I mean, I think one medicine, I mean, there's a lot of different definitions for one medicine, but the one you just laid out is, is I, I think is perfectly valid. I mean, another definition is, is medicine that benefits people, animals, the environment, sort of a much broader scope of one medicine. That's a bit of a different conversation. But yeah, I mean, anything that is encompassing of multiple modalities and multiple philosophies, I think, I, you know, I, I think would, would, would qualify. Well, it's so interesting because we have a family friend who is an anesthesiologist, so very much Western trained, you know, in the medical field. And he was uh, he was a part of Doctors Without Borders. Right. Mm -hmm. And he was somewhere in the Middle East where they, they run into a lot of issues with the water that's available and like the, the safety of the water. And he ended up drinking some of the water and became very ill. And the way he described it, he always talks about how he was basically on death's door. He said, I was bedridden. Nothing was working. Couldn't and keep any fluids in exactly i mean hydrated like worst case scenario in this situation sure. and they brought in this you know short little probably 70 or 80 year old woman from the local village and she right. put four or five acupuncture needles in him and i think 20 or 30 minutes later he was up moving around and he said it was in that moment i don't think i ever would have truly valued acupuncture as an effective resource had i not experienced it and i think that's what a lot of people run into no, I, I would agree with you. I mean, because it 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 very much sounds like from a Western perspective, it sounds very hocus pocusy. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it makes zero sense from the standpoint of how we're trained. Yeah. Um, but but the bottom line is is all you need to do is see it work. Yeah. Um, and and you know, I mean, I, you know, for example, like I have I have an acupuncturist that works in my office. She she has been uh, she used to be the dean of the Chinese medical school in San Francisco for many oh, wow. years. She's a career Chinese medical doctor, healer, academic. I've seen this woman do things with acupuncture needles that I did not think were possible. <laughs> and there is no other explanation for why these animals get better. Um, uh, you know, I mean, the the running joke is, is that she never has room in her schedule because her patients don't die. Yeah, they just keep on going. <laughs> That's hilarious. So, so she never takes new patients because she just keeps the ones she has alive. Yeah, and that's so that's so contradictory to what it seems is the rest of the veterinary profession. And like this family friend, he said he goes, "I've been very trained in the Western modality, but." People wouldn't do this for thousands of years if it didn't work. He said people are and not that's, stupid. That, that's the other true thing about it is like, you know, like I've heard people discount Chinese medicine. I'm like, you're legitimately going to throw away three to 5,000 years <laughs> worth of medical tradition just because it doesn't make sense to you. Right. It's so close minded. Getting down to its core, what are the main differences between holistic medicine and conventional medicine the way i would describe it is western medicine western medicine treats a symptom it treats a disease it treats an infection um holistic medicine as the name would imply treats the whole patient so what we're doing with holistic medicine is frequently we are providing that patient with what their body needs to be healthy on the whole, uh, you know, and and you know, so 
So we're supporting the immune system, for example. We're supporting digestion. We're providing nutrients that the body needs to help the body heal itself. Um, and, and, you know, in many cases that works great. Uh, but to be clear, um, you know, I think from a Western medical perspective, probably most of us would be dead right now without antibiotics at some <laughs> point in our lives. You know, I mean, who hasn't taken antibiotics at some point in our lives? I mean, right. people literally right. used to die from the most ridiculous things <laughs> prior to the advent of antibiotics. So like there are times when that is, you know, I mean, what I've often said to people is like, if you get hit by a bus, you don't need an acupuncturist. Right. Yeah. <laughs> if you're still alive a month later, you probably do. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, I mean, it's, it, and again, that's the, that's the integration of all of this is, knowing when is the right time to use the right thing. Well, and it kind of reminds me of like vaccinations. That was one of the things when we started to get into this world and we started to learn a lot, we were like, are we really anti-vax? And the truth is we're not. It just, we're pro-responsible vaccination. It's just like with antibiotics. Antibiotics are really good at what they're designed to do. They're just most likely overused in modern society. Oh, for sure. And you know what, the way I usually put that is I am, I am absolutely not, I am not anti-vax. I am anti-overvax. Exactly. Yes. And I think, I think when it comes to animals, particularly dogs and cats, I think most dogs and cats are over-vaccinated. Yep. Would totally um, agree. And, and, you know, that's a, that's a conversation to have, but I mean, it's, it's such a hot button issue right now. And there's so much politics involved, like, but you're really getting close to the third rail if you say anything about, <laughs> I don't think you should vaccinate this animal. Yeah. So in terms of pet parents, what are some of your top tips for um, them to focus on with their pet's well-being? Uh, as, as I think you know, I've, I mean, I've recently come out with a couple of books specifically uh, looking at longevity for pets. So longevity for dogs and longevity for cats. And in those books, I go through... I go through step by step the things that people can do to help their pets live longer, healthier, happier lives. Um, and the first three things I talk about, I mean, you know, we, you know, there's a very long discussion in the book about, about supplements, pharmaceuticals, regenerative medicine, all kinds of high tech stuff, stem cell therapy, what have you. But the first three things I talk about are three things that anybody can do at home and you don't need me. Uh, and the three things are diet, exercise, and lifestyle. Uh, and if you look at the science between all three of those things, it is unquestionable that if you optimize those three things, you or your pet are going to live longer. And if you don't, statistically speaking, they're not. Uh, you know, so diet, meaning we have to really look at minimally processed fresh whole food diets. So throw away the kibble, throw away the canned food. Um, so fresh food can look like any number of things and we don't have to get into that whole involved conversation right now, but you know, frozen, freeze dried, homemade from a balanced recipe, what have you. So diet, exercise, appropriate amounts of exercise are critical for both physical and mental health. And that is true for dogs and cats as well. Um, and it is as important not to over-exercise as much as it is not to under-exercise. And when it comes to animals, it's also really important to understand what types of what types and amounts of exercise are appropriate for your specific pet. So, for example, you know, if person A has a border collie and person B has a pug, <laughs> their exercise regimens are not going to be the same. No, no. quite different. <laughs> you know, either you're going to have a either you're going to have a border collie that's going ape shit because they're because they're not getting enough exercise or you're gonna have a pug that you're gonna run into the ground <laughs> because they can't run like that so you have to much like everything else you know that all of the best medicine is personalized medicine like there is no one size fits all right so the same is true for exercise uh and then when we get to lifestyle uh you know the whole commentary about lifestyle is about maintaining to the extent that it's possible a relatively low stress lifestyle. There is no question in the research about the effect that stress and elevated cortisol have on our systems 
and our pet systems. And if you think that your high stress, high anxiety home is not rubbing off on your pet, you got another thing coming. Yeah. So again, it's about setting up a lifestyle with your pet that, you know, A, is relatively low stress. I mean, everybody's going to have a bad day. It's not like that can never happen. But B, the other piece of it is, it's like, you need to make sure that your lifestyle and your pet's lifestyle are compatible. Yeah. You know, again, sort of getting back to that border collie, you know, if you're a person that lives in a one bedroom condo and you work a 16 hour day, probably a border collie is not the dog for you. <laughs> that dog's going to go nuts. They're going to eat your couch yeah. and you're both going to be miserable and high stress. So, but if you're the kind of person that, you know, you work from home, you're out all the time, you can take your dog out for four hours of walking every day, maybe your border collie is a great dog for you. Yeah. So again, it's all, a, it's all a personalized thing, but you know, diet, exercise, lifestyle, these are things that anybody can do. Don't have to pay me a whole bunch of money. Uh, if you need more information, spend a tiny bit of money, buy the book, read all about it, and you're done. Yeah. And if you want to go further, then we can certainly talk about supplements, pharmaceuticals, medical therapy, regenerative medicine, all that super cool stuff that the future is incredibly bright for. But the foundation of this whole thing, anybody can do at home. So I want to delve into diet a little bit more. And this is, you know, this is very much what we talk about on a daily basis. But I want to get your take. Why fresher foods, less processed foods over highly processed foods like your conventional kibbles? To start from a very easy place, um, we all intuitively know that the more fresh food and the less processed food we eat, the healthier we tend to be. I mean, that's, that's not a mystery to anybody. You don't need a PhD in nutrition to understand this. On the more science end of it, you know, why is that the case? Well, you know, when we look at highly processed foods, you know, we're looking at a number of things. We're looking at nutrient profiles that are not optimal for the body and realize that every species on the planet evolved to thrive on a certain spectrum of nutrients. Now, certainly what my body thrives on is a little bit different than my dog is a little bit different than a cat, but every species evolved to thrive on a certain spectrum of nutrients and every species evolved eating fresh whole food diets. So nobody evolved to eat food out of a bag or a can. <laughs> so, so, you know, this whole concept of, of, you know, putting a bunch of preservatives in food, um, you know, doing things to food so that you can take fresh food and give it a shelf life of three years. Like you have to do stuff to food in order to make that happen. And what that stuff is, is generally speaking, it's some kind of preservative. It's some kind of cooking method that frequently creates chemical compounds in the food, such as ed advanced glycation end products, Maillard product reactants, chemical, con these are chemical compounds. You'll never see them on a food label because it's not an ingredient <laughs> that's put in there. It's a compound that is created as a side effect of the processing. But if you look into the research, what you find is these compounds cause inflammation. These compounds cause cancer. They cause all kinds of problems. And the crazy thing is when you look at the amount of these chemical compounds that are present in say kibble, uh, you're looking at a dog or a cat eating kibble, you're looking at animals that are eating many, many more times the amount of these compounds than the average human is in a day. So like we're, and, and they're eating this food every single day. You know, like I do my best to eat as much fresh food as I can, but I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I don't occasionally go out and eat junk food mm -hmm. because I do. Um, but the thing is, is that on the aggregate, I'm doing my best to eat as healthy a food as I can. When you're feeding your dog or your cat kibble, you're basically feeding them junk food every meal, every day of their life. I don't think anybody would advocate that a good lifestyle for a person is to go to McDonald's every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that's effectively what we're doing uh, with these animals. And then everybody scratches their head about why these animals are aging quickly and getting sick. Please forgive the soapbox. How long ago was it that you kind of started to discover the more holistic and integrative methods? Um, I would say probably 
21, 22 years ago. Okay, so over the last two decades, let's say, what kind of success stories have you seen or what have you seen that's really reinforced this belief that the integrative practice is the best thing to practice? You know, I see it. I see it in my office every day. Um, you know, we see animals that come in that have chronic, chronic problems. So chronic skin issues, chronic gastrointestinal problems, achy joints, what have you. Um, and many of these patients come to us after having been to multiple veterinarians, having been to specialists, uh, with, with little or no success. And then, you know, what you start to do is you start to, again, you know, you, starting with that foundation, diet, exercise, lifestyle. We make adjustments in their diet. Uh, we talk about how much exercise they're getting. We talk about their lifestyle. We very frequently will start to put them on uh, supplements that will support their body specific to whatever their particular you know, medical issue is. And you see these animals improve when people have literally spent months and sometimes years uh, with, with, you know, with, with other practitioners, other specialists and getting nowhere. Um, and all of a sudden things start to improve. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, you know, you see it once or twice and, you know, you might think, okay, well, maybe that's an outlier, but like, it just happens over and over and over again. Like there's just, there's no way around it, yeah. uh, is the fact that, you know, that, that this stuff works. And, you know, I mean, to me, the crazy thing, and I've often, I often chuckle about this, like, legitimately the lowest hanging fruit in veterinary medicine is food um, because it is unfortunately probably the worst advice that most veterinarians are giving are giving pet owners is is what to feed animals and 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 to be clear like i don't hold that against veterinarians because we get no education when yeah, it comes to nutrition exactly. and what little tiny amount of education we do get when it comes to nutrition either directly or indirectly comes from the big pet food companies. So I, I you know, I mean, that's where their information's coming from. So needless to say, that's what they're going to recommend, but like purely getting people to get their pets off of those highly processed foods can make such a dramatic difference in quality of life. Like if I did nothing else, I would still be doing a good job. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think what people fail to realize, and we get a lot of these comments, you know, we recently shared a video about some cancer fighting smoothie treats that have, you know, foods, fruits and vegetables that are very high in antioxidants. And I think what a lot of people assume is that we're saying this integrative side, this holistic side, this is like some magic bullet or some magic thing we found in nature that cures everything. And the truth is, it's not. We've just gone so far to mess up the system that we're trying to heal that switching them to something they evolved to eat can can show benefits that might seem like magic, but it's just putting the body back into homeostasis. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Um, and like I say, that's that's why I look at it as this unbelievably low hanging fruit. Like, like I say, like eating a healthy diet is not rocket science. <laughs> Unfortunately, like the pet food companies have made it rocket science. Yes. Um, and like, I don't want to completely throw the pet food companies under the bus here. Like they have actually done some very good work and some very good research. Um, but, you know, and and to a certain extent, like. You know the the market is consumer driven. Yeah. Um. And and you know I mean the 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 God's honest truth is is that dry food and canned food really only exists for one reason, and the reason why it exists is our convenience. Yep. Yeah. It's easy. So as long as people are gonna buy it, somebody's gonna make it and sell it. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I and I you know I I often wonder like, one of these years I'm gonna walk into a big veterinary conference. And one of these big pet food companies, be it, you know, Hills or, 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 or uh, Royal Canin or who Purina, whoever it may be, is suddenly going to introduce a line of fresh food diets. Mm -hmm. um, and if they follow true to form, not only are they going to do that, but then they're going to claim they invented the thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to chuckle and I'm going to say, thank God, um, because I don't really claim, I don't really care whether they claim they invented the damn thing or not. But the bottom line is, is that nobody has the marketing wherewithal and resources that big pet food does Seriously. in that marketplace. 
So fine, if they want to start evangelizing fresh food, I don't care if they're late to the party. It's fine. Yep. Let them do it. Right, because at the end of the day, there's one goal in mind, and it's to improve the health of pets. And yeah, we know I, I mean, I've often said there's no room for ego in medicine. Yeah, I really don't care as long as we get to the place we need to get. I love. I don't that. care who does it. We have a motto that's like, we're not here to be right; we're here to get it right, and that comes with a level of being wrong at many points in our life because that's what yeah. science is. That's what discovering things is. Discovering things is. And I, you mentioned earlier about you know the Mars gonna they're gonna buy up a, a fresh food company or they're gonna come out with a line of fresh food. We're literally already already seeing that with the acquisition of Champion Pet Foods. They yeah. you know how how many years was grain free food demonized and probably. At the, I think the big pet food companies kind of had the megaphone in that situation. And then years later, when more research comes out and it's not actually the case, they're like, well, we want a hand in that market then, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, I mean, let's be clear like the whole grain free debacle was effectively manufactured by big pet food. <laughs> they caused that problem. Yep. We'll throw out an yeah. allegedly in there for legal reasons. <laughs> Very well. They allegedly caused that problem. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, I mean, like, that was never a problem before grain-free became a marketing buzzword. Yeah, exactly. We literally just did a podcast a few hours ago with Hana from Evermore. I don't know if you know Oh, Evermore. sure, I know Hana. Yeah, she's amazing. And she was literally talking about, she's like, the, the DCM cases have not risen in the last 20 or 30 years. Like, they're not rising with the level of grain-free pet food. It's just like there's a lot of buzzwords going on here and a lot of, you know, new discoveries that people want to point the finger with. So. Yeah, it's true. So, uh, yeah, I mean, now more than ever, like, you know, you really, you really have sort of have to do a little due diligence with these sorts of things. Like, you can't. I don't want to say don't trust the media because that's terrible. Um, but, <laughs> but I hear I mean, you. <laughs> but at the same time, I mean, like, be a discerning consumer yeah. of media. Yeah. Don't, don't blindly trust play. anything. Like, you, you know, look, go in an added layer. See if you can verify the information. Especially if you're getting your news from social media. Yes. And God as influencers. If you're getting your news from social media. Yeah. As influencers who are also educators, we still advocate double check this stuff if we say something go see if another veterinarian says this because you should be doing yeah. that with everything that you come across agreed dr richter where do you see the future of holistic pet health going and what kind of roles do you think technology is going to play in that that's a fun question um i think the way that medicine in general is going and i think this is true for uh people as well as animals as you are going to see you're gonna see a greater and greater focus put on longevity as a goal of medicine. Um, uh, you know, you're already seeing that with, uh, with a lot of the research that's being done, um, particularly on the human side. Um, you know, there's a lot that's being, that's being unlocked right now, as far as the mechanisms that cause aging and how to intervene with them. And are you saying like longevity is going to be a goal as opposed to just kind of treating symptoms? That's exactly what I'm saying. So I'm saying like, yeah, like obviously like if a person has heart disease that needs to be treated, but the question becomes is like, how do you prevent their cells from aging so they don't get heart disease to yeah. begin with? Um, and so I think that you are going to see that happen more and more in, in, you know, first in human medicine, there's just the whispers of discussion that are happening on the veterinary field. Um, you know, I wrote those two books, longevity for dogs and longevity for cats, because I am somewhat involved in the, in the longevity medicine community on the human side. Um, and I find it absolutely fascinating and pretty much nobody's doing anything on the veterinary side, um, with a few exceptions, but, um, but nonetheless, um, so I think, I think that is a, is a, is a big direction that things are going, um, you know, and, and some of that is going to be some of this real basic stuff we're talking about diet, exercise, lifestyle, but some of it's going to be much, much more high tech. Um, there's going to be the implementation of supplementation and pharmaceuticals specifically to intervene with mechanisms of aging. There's going to be uh, technological 
uh, um, advancements like regenerative medicine. Uh, so stem cell therapies that are, you know, dramatically effective from the standpoint of helping regenerate uh, parts of the body. Uh, there's a, a, a treatment that's just starting to gain a little traction on the human side called plasma exchange therapy, mm. um, uh, which is really, really fascinating science. But effectively what you're, you know, what you're doing is, is you're basically taking, you're taking the plasma from an older person or an older animal and replacing it with younger plasma. Uh, and it turns out that that actually can have a dramatic effect on body function. Wow. Oh, that's so crazy. it's, I mean, this kind of stuff is really, really exciting science that's going on. Um, and all of that stuff is discussed in the books. Not all of that stuff is available in the veterinary community right at this moment, but I think it's really important for people to know about it because it's coming. Yeah, that's really cool. So, okay, now to kind of get back to some of the basics, let's say you have your average pet parent pretty limited budget. They're feeding kibble from the grocery store. They have a dog with, you know, various issues, albeit, you know, skin or gut or teeth or whatever it may be. What are some practical things they can start doing right now to boost the health of their animal? So, I mean, step one would be, let's figure out the question of, is it possible to start to incorporate some fresh food into this animal's diet? Uh, it may or may not be practical from a financial perspective for somebody to completely move into fresh food. Um, but, you know, I mean, again, you know, think about this from the human side. Um, you know, it's better that I eat some fresh food than eat no fresh food. Uh, it's not as if if I were to tell my doctor, well, you know, I can't eat fresh food every single day that my doctor would say, well, in that case, don't worry about it. Just eat at McDonald's. <laughs> like, so the bottom line is, is the more fresh food they're eating, the better. Um, and, you know, and, and so that can look like buying fresh foods and using it as a topper. It can look like buying actual fresh foods uh and you know like adding adding meats and vegetables to your pet's diet not like a pre-made pre-made thing um there's a lot of ways to do this um so i think that i think that would be one thing uh you know i think there are some very very easy supplements that somebody can add to their animal's diet uh probably the you know the lowest hanging fruit on the supplement tree are omega fatty acids mm -hmm. particularly like fish oil um, you know, most people and most animals are deficient in omega-3 fats. Uh, omega-3 fats are important for gut health, immunity. They have anti-cancer function. They support organ function. Uh, they're anti-inflammatory. They're good for the skin. It just goes on and on and on. Um, so adding some fish oil to your pet's diet, not particularly expensive, super easy thing to do. Uh, you know, probiotics, again, you're supporting gut health, you're supporting immunity. These are all good things that you can do. And, and furthermore, I mean, if your budget is limited and, and, you know, and again, I mean, at the, the risk of shameless self-promotion, um, I've got two books out there. Um, the ultimate pet health guide, which is a comprehensive look at integrative medicine for dogs and cats and the new books, longevity for dogs and longevity for cats, spend 20 bucks, buy a book, learn and yep. see what you can do, you know, at home by yourself before you have to pay a veterinarian a whole bunch of money. Sometimes what you're actually finding out when you're learning that is what you don't wanna do. <laughs> Sometimes it's a question of like this whole conversation of like, does my dog really need that vaccine? Yeah. You know, might actually save you money by not doing stuff you might, all, you, you might otherwise have done. Right, absolutely. I absolutely love that. Where can people connect with you? Where can they buy your books? Where can they find you on social media, website, all that stuff? Sure. So. Um, the books you can find on Amazon, um, you know, just look up my name and again, the ultimate pet health guide uh, and or longevity for dogs and longevity for cats. Uh, my office website for anybody who happens to be in Northern California and might want to come see me is holisticvetcare.com. Uh, Instagram, I believe I am at pet vet expert. Um, you can also find uh, the food and supplements uh, that I design at ultimatepetnutrition.com. So that's uh, freeze-dried raw diets for dogs and cats, um, whole food uh, supplements for dogs and cats. So, you know, all the same kind of stuff that we've just been talking about that, that I've spent years formulating and putting together. 
That's amazing. Dr. Richter, thank you. We really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your knowledge with us and our audience. It means the world to us. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. And for those of you that are listening or watching, thank you so much for choosing to spend your time with us. As always, I'm Bryce. I'm Kinsey. And we'll see you in the next episode.